What's up, friends, and welcome to this special Saturday cut day edition of the DNVR Broncos podcast. Before we hop into the show, nothing says Saturday like a little golf. But right now in Denver, it's 99 degrees, a little too hot to play golf outside. So I got the perfect solution for you. Download WGT Golf. It's the most popular golf game in the world. And you can play golf, whether it's 99 degrees like it is today, whether it's 38 degrees and snowing like it's going to be in Denver on Tuesday, WGT Golf. You can play any time of the day, any time of the year. So how do you download WGT Golf? Go to dnvrgolf.com to download it. That lets WGT know that you want to play with us. Download the free app. Then once you're in there, go to the clubhouse section, search for DNVR3. That's DNVR and the number three next to it to join our clubhouses. And here you get all the exclusive access that comes with being in our clubhouses. It like playing in our weekly tournaments. Got going, got one going on this weekend. So make sure to get in to WGT Golf right now to get in on that weekend tournament because we want to play with you. We have 750 members in there from this awesome community playing WGT Golf, and we want you to play as well. So go to dnvrgolf.com, download WGT Golf. All right, Mace, let's hop into the show. From this country, is Sitting in the south stands, drinking the curves from my life, best part of the weekend. Hugging a perfect stranger, as they become a friend. Having a good time when the orange and blue double you at end. Tuning in every day with the good folks down D and VR. Welcome, welcome, welcome into the DNVR Broncos podcast on this special edition. I'm your host, Zach Stevens, joined by my main man, Andrew Mason. And before we hop in to an action-packed show, got to tell you guys about our presenting sponsor, MSU Denver Online. MSU Denver Online puts a dynamic education at your fingertips without forcing you to decide between earning a degree and living your life. And we have a couple of people at the DNVR dot com that are that are taking classes at msu denver online and what they say is exactly that they don't force you to uh either either live your life or earn a degree you can do both of those we know that a lot of people out there can't just stop their life to take classes and that's what msu denver does such a good job of they design the schedules around you and also teach you things that you need to know for once you graduate once you finish that class it's not just reading out of a textbook their professors are also professionals in the field that you're learning about. So make sure to check out all they have to offer, including over 40 online and hybrid programs and 750 classes. So check them out at msudenver.edu slash online. My boy, Mace, wow. what's up? I am, I'm glad I pulled my headphones away there. Wow. Uh, how that are you even, doing? I'm doing all right, even by your standards of boundless enthusiasm zach that <laughs> was bringing the thunder right there <laughs> maybe wow. it's these noise canceling headphones i actually thought i went <laughs> soft i thought i thought i went soft on you there mace oh yeah they, they cancel it for you but not for everybody else I've, <laughs> I, I've got the cheap sony studio models that i've got about four I've, I've got about four pairs of these one always goes to the radio studio with me and my carry my briefcase all the time you know they're just basically disposable things but somehow these have lasted like three years i'm not really sure why so yeah anyway. i don't really i don't really <laughs> know if i've heard of cheap and sony put together it's their yeah th this is their cheapest headphone it's like 29.95 mm, yeah uh, down at best buy i mean they're basically they're not designed to last more than a few months but they serve me fine but yeah they're not they're not noise canceling they're not fancy actually i probably uh Probably should get some noise canceling uh, headphones here now that we're starting the uh, we're starting the game coverage road trip phase of the year. I feel like I'm I'm gonna need them to uh, you know to just underscore social distancing on the planes going around the country here the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very very true. And, and May speaking of <laughs> things that aren't everlasting, the Broncos' 80 man roster. <laughs> we knew it was going to have to come to an end. 
and it did so just a couple minutes ago. That's why we're bringing you a live podcast right now to break everything down. Mace, we'll talk about Todd Davis later Mm -hmm. in the pod because I got to get your reaction to that. But the moves that were made today, what was the one that jumped off the page to you? Well, I know Jake Butt is the headline, but at this point, it wasn't a surprise that he made the roster. Just looking at how he was being used, they were giving him some first-team repetitions from time to time over the course of training camp. Clearly, if Jake Butt was healthy, he's going to be a part of this tight end rotation. But the one that jumps out today is Devontae Bosby. And let's just kind of retrace the steps of Bosby over the last few weeks. Got off to a... Yeah, (laughs) nice nice sound effect. I like that. Got off to a really good start in in training camp. Had a soft tissue injury. And at the same time, Devontae Harris began to emerge. And then is saying Bassey gained some confidence. And really, I think sort of the final step of this was is saying Bassey getting some first-team reps this week. I think if I have a surprise, it's that Bosby was kept ahead of Duke Dawson because in terms of how they were used in training camp, Bosby was always ahead of Duke Dawson, uh, always getting more work. But with Duke Dawson and also Michael Ojemudia and even Mark Barron, you have three guys who in a pinch can play safety. And they're going to have special teams involvement as well. And I think that was a big part of what led to the decision to move on from Devontae Bosby. Now it would not surprise me at all. If Bosby is on the practice squad, because he's eligible, you can have six guys who have, who have any amount of experience. So you could see five year guys, 10 year guys and Bosby, unlike the other players let go today was released, not waived because he, he is a vested veteran. So I think, but I, I wouldn't surprise me to see Bosby back on the practice squad, but still a little bit of a surprise given how he started and uh, how he was still playing even as camp went on. Yeah, I totally agree. And Mace, let's rewind even further to, to than just a couple weeks ago. Let's go all the way back to last year when the Broncos signed Devontae Bosby. <laughs> okay, now we're back to last year. Did and- you ever see Wayne's World, by the way? Uh, no, only a little bit. Okay, so when they cu- when they have the different endings and they just go back a few minutes, they go. That's what that reminds me of. <laughs> that's that's the sound <laughs> effect I needed. <laughs> and Mace last year with Bosby, he was playing great in training camp, and there were multiple times where Vic Fangio was asked about Bosby playing really well. I mean, mm-hmm. he was set up to just blow yeah. an answer out of the water with confidence for Bosby. And Vic went the opposite way. And he said, you know, how he's still making these mistakes and Mm -hmm. kind of getting after Bosby's approach to the game and maybe off, uh, not off the the field stuff, but stuff in in meeting rooms that he wasn't doing. So I have to imagine that that played a part in this as well. Now, today when Vic was asked about it, he he didn't actually mention Bosby's name specifically. He just said versatility Mm -hmm. was part of it. So I think you're 100% right. And that's how Duke Dawson got yeah. the role over him because Duke Dawson can play a little safety if you really need to. Bosby, you weren't really ever going to put him back there uh, at safety, but it is really interesting, this cornerback room, how much it's changed in the past week or mm-hmm. so. Mace, I wouldn't be shocked if we see Michael Ojemudia make a huge push for that third cornerback role by week one or by week two. And of course he's been injured. We haven't seen him at all. It definitely looked like at the beginning of camp that Bosby was that third guy. And now you have Bassey who's coming out of nowhere, a a fantastic story. And when asked about him today, Vic said he he likes what he's seen, compared him to Bryce Callahan when Bryce Callahan was uh, Mm. uh, in Chicago with Vic in terms of he thinks he's at the same place that Bryce Callahan was during his rookie year. But he pointed to the one practice where he played with the ones on Thursday. And that brings up a question I have for you. Are the Broncos basing too much on that one practice from moving on from Yadam in the trade and by cutting Devonte Bosby so they can keep us saying Bassey? Are, are they placing too much on that one practice? Uh, maybe a little bit, but I do think that things kind of led up to that. And with, with Bassey in particular, Vic pointed out that he wanted to see that it wasn't too big for him. 
And when he got his first work out there with the ones earlier this week, he thought that Bosby showed that it wasn't too big for him. And I think uh, it was sort of to reassure them a little bit because uh, Bassey's somebody who you probably, even after you put the word out there that he was getting reps with the ones, he probably still had a chance of slipping him uh, to the, the practice squad. Not a great chance, but a chance. So I think, I think there was an open, I think there was an opening for it still to be Bosby ahead of Bassey. But uh, when Bassey kind of reassured them, Based on what he did this week, uh, that that's enough. Now that being said, everyone's flying blind a little bit because there are no preseason games. It's saying Bassey, you can go by the game reps at Wake Forest, but that's completely different than getting to the NFL. So, uh, how is he going to be if he's playing when the lights go on? I think that's a huge question. Another thing that you can't dismiss as well is the general upward trend for Devonte Harris, who did play extensively last year and then lost his grip on the Ross on a on a starting job at the end of November and then didn't play much in December. But Harris was able to reset, got better as camp went on. The fact that he's been challenged, the fact that he's played extensively, they know that he can go in there and could be that number three cornerback. So I think that factors in as well. OJ Moody, I think it's going to be wait and see. Watching him last night, um, obviously because the reporting guidelines can't say too much, but it was up and down for Ojemudia last night. And okay. watching him and looking back this morning at the notes I took on him during practice, I thought that he probably needed a little bit more practice time, a little bit more seasoning to be ready to contribute substantially on defense. Maybe they feel like they can get him up to speed over the course of the first month here. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's probably realistic with Oja Mudia. And Mace, you're 100% right. Devontae Harris is the guy that flew under the radar all training camp. But every time I saw number 27 out there, Mace, he looked good. He yep. looked very solid. Now, I think you lose something by going Devontae Harris because you get consistency, but not necessarily the big playability like Devontae Bosby had. But Devontae Bosby probably going to blow a couple of coverages. So the Broncos are, e even though it's no. being preached that the Broncos need to create more and more turnovers than last year, they're going the safe route, which which I'm okay with. I am I just am surprised that Devontae Bosby di did not make it. So Mace, how comfortable are you with this cornerback group? Pretty comfortable because Devontae Harris can provide what you were thinking of with Devontae Bosby in terms of his level of play. But like you said, uh, he Bosby brought something in terms of plays on the ball. And that's what you're lacking. And that's what you're going to need Michael Ojemudia to step up in because plays on the ball are something that he made frequently at Iowa. And hopefully he can do that. I think the lack of practice time sets him back from being able to contribute all that much early. But uh, that being said, you got a couple weeks to work with here. I'm not to denigrate the Titans passing game, but <laughs> this is a game where you're probably going to run your base defense more than you will in the following weeks. So in this year where like John Elway alluded to, everybody is dealing with, the lack of preseason games, the lack of OTAs, uh, limit, limited uh, padded practice reps once they finally got out there. In this year where everything looks so different, uh, everyone's going to have something that they have to kind of cover up a little bit. Take the next couple weeks of practice. Try to get Ojemudia up to speed. Uh, get a little bit more out of Devontae, Devontae Harris. And then you'll be ready to go for week two, a game where you probably will have to lean extensively on those sub packages against Big Ben and the array of receiving targets that he has. The, the first week, you can kind of go more base and you can kind of uh, protect and and cover uh, these young guys in the secondary a little bit. Starting with week two, it gets, it gets real. And then it gets real, real fast against Tom <laughs> Brady and all of those targets in week three that with all respect to who the Broncos have in the secondary and at coverage linebacker, I don't know if the Broncos have enough to deal with everything Tampa Bay will throw at them. Yeah, I totally agree, <laughs> man. You're right, Mace. You get an easy <laughs> week to start in terms of uh, your pass defense. And then, yes. boom, it picks up quick because Ben Roethlisberger is a guy that can drop 500 <laughs> yards on you, and we, we all know what uh, Tom Brady can do. I'm not going to say it's easy, however – you're concerned about one guy with Tennessee, right? In the passing game, you're concerned about A.J. Brown. 
Yep. Well, and- you got a, a, your AJ, AJ Boye. The way he looks right now, I'm counting on him to lock down AJ Brown in week one. That's what you're paying Boye for. Exactly. And not to make it too simplistic, though, but this is how I feel. A.J. Brown's not going to beat you. Now, could he? Sure, he could go for 200 yards because he is that talented. But Derrick Henry is going to beat you. He is going to win that game for the Titans mm-hmm. if they do it. So it's it, it, it's a good point, Mace. You don't have to worry too much about that right away. And Mace, Vic Fangio said last night he's going to decide the Broncos' third cornerback this Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Your guess right now, who is it? My guess is start of the season will be Devontae Harris. Yep. I think that I, that's the safest choice here. It would shock me if it was Duke Dawson, just given how he was used throughout training camp. Third team, he seemed pretty well down the depth chart. Uh, it seems like Duke Dawson is being kept for versatility and special teams more than specifically having a regular role on the defense. But I also think it's trending toward uh, Michael Ojemudia and saying Bassey continuing to grow and maybe seeing more of them over the course of the season if Devontae Harris has some struggles like he did last year. Remember Minnesota really picking on him when the Vikings had that comeback in Minneapolis last November. If there's another game like that, then that could create an opening for Bassey or Ojemudia if they progress enough in, pro- in practice to get more playing time. I couldn't agree with you. I'm just going to say I agree with that, Mace. I think it's going to be Devontae Harris with those other guys picking up steam pretty quickly. And with Duke Dawson, Mm -hmm. the Broncos only kept three safeties, Mace. We knew that three were locked in. Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson, and Trey Marshall. And then we said... I don't, I don't know if any other guy's going to make it. And, and that was right. No right. other safety made it. And I do think Duke Dawson is the most versatile guy in that cornerback room to go play safety. So I think he had that going for him. And Mace, how crazy is it that there was really a three-way competition when Michael, when Michael Ojemudia got hurt for that third mm-hmm. cornerback spot? Who knew that the two that didn't get that third job were going to be off the team? I mean, we thought it was going to be, you know, whoever won it was third, next was fourth, the next was fifth on the depth chart. Nope. If you win it, you're on the team. If not, see ya, Isaac yeah. Gavin and, uh, and Devontae Bosby. NFL is not for long, as the old cliche goes, right? And yeah. uh, certainly there, I think I just kind of keep coming back to the whole thing of how if they're, the surprise there is is Duke Dawson being ahead of Devontae Bosby. And I get the rationale for it that Vic Fangio spoke of, but still a little bit of a surprise. I agree. And Mace, another surprise on the roster, sticking with the defensive side, Justin Hollins. Man, when I first saw the news come down, to me, I felt bad for Justin because it almost felt like he got Demarcus Walker even harder than Demarcus Walker got Demarcus Walker because man, they just never, the Broncos never chose a position for him. In fact, just a week ago, they were throwing him from outside to inside and he was never able to find a place on the roster. And that's, that's pretty much what it came down to. He didn't master anything and just didn't have a, a spot on this team. Uh, Vic, after, after uh, the cuts today, told us that they would like to bring him back if he doesn't get picked up. But being a fifth-round pick, he, he might get picked up. Did that surprise you as well? A little bit. I did have Justin Hollins on my 53, but I also did kind of try to go for the offense-defense balance that the Broncos have had most years, not all, but most years they've set the 53 in the John Elway era. They've gone for 25 offensive players, 25 defensive players, and three specialists. This year went for 26 offensive players, 24 defensive players, three specialists. So you can kind of say, even though they're completely different positions, that it was Calvin Anderson or Justin Hollins. Yeah. And they went with Calvin Anderson, which we'll get into when we discuss the offense yeah. on the other side. But uh, uh, it was a mild surprise because I don't know that he's going to slip through. A lot of people liked his athleticism range and potential coming out of the Shrine game back in January of 2019. That's where he really turned some heads. But the, the thing with Justin Hollins, 
when the Broncos drafted him, they talked about him being a guy who could work at inside linebacker, work at outside linebacker. So potentially if he was providing depth, he could save you a roster spot. But the problem is to save you a roster spot and do that. He had to be on the second team of both. And he hadn't shown that Malik Reed clearly passed him yeah. as an outside linebacker. And I think, a big part of the reason why you're talking about Justin Hollins not being on this 53 is the play of Malik Reed, who got that starting opportunity for a good chunk of last year, eventually got pipped in the lineup by Jerry Atakshu, but sort of like Devontae Harris, Zach, came out this summer and really showed a lot of resilience, a lot of progress, showed that he grew from some of the experiences that he had on the had in games last year, some of them that weren't great. They struggle with consistency at times and effectively Malik Reed, even though he was undrafted last year, effectively Malik Reed is now playing the role of Justin Hollins, sort of like how at running back a few years back, you had Monte ball and CJ Anderson in the same rookie class and you cut Monte ball, but CJ Anderson was sort of, Filling that role, he had surpassed him. He had proven to be a better prospect for reasons on and off the field. This kind of feels like a similar equation here. And remember, as you know, the, the farther you get from the draft, the less draft status matters. Yeah, just ask Philip Lindsay about that. Um, so I, I completely agree with you, Mace. And let's let's now talk about the inside linebackers to kind of round out the defense. Of course, you had Todd Davis, but today. Mace, quickly, I think another guy who kind of surprised a lot of people was Joe Jones making the fifth inside linebacker spot. And before we get any further, it looks like we have a special guest with us. Yeah, Ruby uh, has decided to join me. I did not realize that Ruby was underfoot here in my desk, and I'm, I, I, I moved my feet, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's going on down there? So, Ruby, you want to say hello? <laughs> so cute. I know. Aww. I know Ruby's going to be a fan favorite. Yeah, Ruby is, uh, he, she's adorable. You, you like the moves today? Oh, you don't care. She's just like, what do I smell here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. some, some lunch? Uh, no, not yet. It's going to have to wait a little bit. Now she wants to find her spot down below. The problem is, down below my desk, because she's a puppy, she's a little bit of a stealth peer and pooper so <laughs> hopefully i won't clean anything up here in a little bit <laughs> uh, well, oh yeah hopefully that's not what you're smelling later in the pot. <laughs> oh boy we got believe me i'm going through the clean the cleaning stuff like you wouldn't believe anyway <laughs> i bet sorry for the tangent there <laughs> so joe jones mace did he surprise you especially being at a fifth outside or inside linebacker no and here's why special teams i mean he was he on the bubble yes but this is somebody that uh, Tom McMahon would prob was probably going to fight for in terms yeah. of making moves. He is a core special teamer, a core leader. He's he's out there on multiple units. And while we heard here when he we heard from John Elway and Vic Fangio, and they were talking about the special teams prowess and potential of Tyree Cleveland, Joe Jones has done it. Now Cleveland has potential. But he's still got to get out there in the games. There's still that unknown factor. There's going to be an unknown factor for guys like Asang Bassi and Michael Ojemudia on special teams if they're out there in that phase early in the season. So you needed some known commodities. Andrew Beck, for example, that's one known commodity. Right. Joe Jones, another known commodity. Um, you even. It, because you didn't keep Fred Brown, you moved on from him and you kept Tyree Cleveland. And then at returner, of course, Deontay Spencer. I know there were some uh, that commented on Twitter about him making the roster. I don't think there was any doubt about Deontay Spencer, but no. the fact that you had no preseason games, it didn't give anyone else a chance to really distinguish themselves. So you were going to go with the guy that you'd already felt comfortable with, had already proven he can do it. And so with experience in short supply in some spots, you want to have at least a few core experienced special teamers. And Joe Jones certainly fits that bill. Speaking of guys that you're comfortable with and guys that have the experience, Todd Davis, they did not go that direction. Uh, Andre and I broke it down yesterday, but Mace, I got to get your feelings on that move. Well, I think in the short term, it's going to cause some problems. Now, mm. long term, I think they'll be okay. Josie Jewell in the box, he's fine there. 
He knows the defense. I think in the base package, he can partner well with Alexander Johnson, offer a good chunk of the same things that that Todd Davis did. The problem is that Todd Davis, while not known for his coverage over the years, has been better in coverage than Josie Jewell. And that was part of why Josie Jewell hasn't played extensively. So you are looking at Mark Barron going in in sub packages. Now, with this sort of timeshare that we're looking at right now with Jewel and Baron, that can work. However, you are probably going to see some teams that maybe look at Mark Barron out there in a sub package and see that as an opportunity, you know, for for a draw play on third and five that maybe they wouldn't use right. otherwise. Right. Or they see Josie Jewel out there on first and ten, and you may see it may be an audible say, okay, hey, let's set up Josie Jewel against a tight end in the flat because that's a matchup that he struggled with. And so these are the things that you're concerned with in terms of a platoon is quarterbacks audibling to something that creates a mismatch and tries to take advantage of the weak spot that each of them have. If you could put the best of Jewel and the best of Mark Barron together, you'd have a Pro Bowl linebacker. But it doesn't <laughs> <Right>. work that way. <laughs> right. So Mace, the Broncos save $4.5 million in cap space by moving mm -hmm. on from, from Todd. And also Todd's coming off his second calf injury in two years. Mm -hmm. Was it a mistake? I think it's one of the, I think it's going to be a mistake early on. But I think once you get past like week five, week six, and also watch the development of Austin Calitro because they like him a lot. And going back and watching him a little bit and, and then doing some number crunching on him, he's always around the ball when he gets out there. Mm. He kind was of like nice, Josh Watson. Yeah, he was he was a nice fit in Seattle at times. And I know uh, uh, Bobby Wagner had some very kind things to say about Austin Calitro uh, on social media and otherwise when the Seahawks let go of him. So I can see why there was some interest from the Broncos in him. Christian Covington wasn't making the team, so... Basically, you, you got something for what you regarded as nothing in terms of your roster calculus uh, at, at the at the cutdown date. So I keep my eyes on him a little bit now. He's bounced around. He's been on six teams to this point. It's been a whistle-stop career for Austin Calitro. But I'm curious to see where he is after four to eight weeks in this scheme because – if he shows some of the same potential that he did in Seattle a couple of years back, I do think he could push for playing time as an every down linebacker. Wow. Wow. And that, that would be impressive because when they brought, when the Broncos brought him in yesterday in that trade for Covington really seemed like it was a good special teams move. Is he, if he's able to uh, make some plays on, on defense, that would be a, a big win. And w speaking of Christian Covington, when the Broncos moved on from him, Mm -hmm. And then good news for Demarcus Walker. So it was no surprise to either of us today that he made the team. Yeah, exactly. They were going to keep six defensive linemen. I briefly, when I was doing an early draft of my uh, of my roster piece, I thought, well, it's a different year. They only activate five defensive linemen on game days. Maybe they keep five. But ultimately, you just want to have yourself covered. And uh, Demarcus Walker actually didn't have a bad camp. At oh. least the practices that I saw, he was generating consistent pass rush, sometimes even working as a nose tackle. So there's some depth there behind Mike Purcell. I I think uh, with Demarcus Walker, he looked fine. He, he yeah. looked like he looked to me like somebody who, kind of what I've been saying over the years, if you use him properly in a specific role focused on the pass rush, he can help you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he looked like a guy that's going to be the sixth defensive lineman that you have, but but a good one because, Mace, if you use him right, then he can be good. But, look, he, we know what his role is long-term on this team. Yeah. It's Draymond Jones and McTelvin Najim are, are jumping him. Mm -hmm. But I would rather have Demarcus Walker than Christian Covington, so I do think they made the, the yeah. right play there. And, Mace, we're talking about football we oh. are we are less than one week away from Kansas City and Houston. We are nine days away from the Broncos taking on Derrick Henry and the Texans, and there's no better place to get in on all of the action than with DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. And to celebrate the return of football, DraftKings is giving all users a no-brainer to start the season. Have you ever heard of a team losing by 100 points? 
I certainly haven't. And for week one, DraftKings is ensuring that even if Kansas City, the Super Bowl champions, were to lose in a historic fashion, you would still cash in. DraftKings Sportsbook has moved the spread to Kansas City plus 101 points for all users. So that's a no-brainer, Mace, right there. And on mm -hmm. top of that, DraftKings is also giving away up to $100 million in prizes to all users who enter their free football survivor pool. All you have to do up is do is sign up for DraftKings Sportsbook, enter their survivor pool, and you'll instantly get a share of up to $100 million in giveaways. So download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code DNVR to take advantage of this no-brainer offer. That's promo code DNVR to get in on all of the action. For a limited time only, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Colorado only. Bonus comprised of a first deposit bonus and a first bet match, each up to $500. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. When you talk about that 100-point line, I think, well, as long as it's not the second coming of Georgia Tech versus Cumberland, that was a 222 to nothing score, I believe, in 1922. As long as you don't have that, you're going to be okay. <laughs> yes, that's for sure. As long as we have football, we're going to be okay. And you know what? It's a hot weekend. We're talking about the Broncos playing next weekend. Even some college football on the tube. I was watching Army host Middle Tennessee while all the cuts were coming in, sitting here in my office, and on a hot day, with some football on the tube, it's a perfect time to enjoy some of those delicious Breckenridge brews. And of course, a hot summer's day like this as summer is ending and winter is coming soon. Today is a great day for a strawberry sky. You sit out on your patio, on your porch, whatever, crack open a strawberry sky, enjoy the warm Colorado air, the warm air, wherever you are. Of course, you can get Strawberry Sky plenty of places. Check out that Breck Beer locator on the Breck Brew website. That's breckbrew.com. Find out where you can get Strawberry Sky or Avalanche Amber Ale or Agave Wheat or Breck Lager or Vanilla Porter or the Lucky You IPA. If you can't decide what you want, you're in Colorado. No problem. Get that 15-can sampler. Go to the grocery store. Go to Costco. Pick up that 15-can sampler. And also, if you're in the Denver area, let's say you don't want to grill tonight. You just want a good meal. Check out the farmhouse down at Breckenridge Brewery's facility in Littleton. It's off Santa Fe. You can use the code DNVR, save $5 off your meal. And, of course, you can go pick it up right there, 303-803-1380. Call them from noon to 8 p.m. to pick up. Use that magical code, like I said, as and as Zach likes to say, DNVR. Get $5 off. And, of course, don't forget, you can get be the all the beers from them as well. There's no better array of Breckenridge Brews. And of course, right down there at Breckenridge Brewery and right at the farmhouse. The restaurant's also open, but you're encouraged to make reservations if you go in person, 303-803-1380. Point being, plenty of ways to get those Breckenridge Brews, even by coming out to the DMVR bar as well, where we've, where we've got an array of Breck Brews on tap. It's the official beer of DNVR. Try it. It might be your official beer too. Yes. Oh, sounds so good right now for this hot Saturday. Mace, let's flip over to the offensive side of the ball where the Broncos kept 26 players on offense and five tight ends. Mm -hmm. They did keep Jake, but Mace, what's your reaction to that? And is that the right move? It's the right move. And Jake, but they weren't going to surrender on him easily. The fact that he's still around with all the knee injuries shows what kind of belief the Broncos have in him. And oh, by the way, you also have to note Austin Fort, not on the 53, but going to IR with a knee injury. So the Broncos are going to bring him back next year. Yep. So Broncos love their tight end depth. They love their tight end depth. They love Austin Fort. They love Jake, but it's, the feel-good story of the summer for the Broncos. And Vic Fangio talking about how he hasn't seen him limping or anything like that. He's looked good. He's looked smooth. Hasn't missed any time in practice. Jake Butt has looked like the guy that should have been a second-round pick before that knee injury in the Orange Bowl. Somebody who just, he's running He's running good routes. He's, when he's asked to block, he's crisp. He's he's not great, okay? He's not Nick Vanette as a blocker. He's definitely more of a receiving target, but he's somebody that can go in line and they can operate in space. Isn't it funny how there was a time not too long ago 
we were talking about tight end being one of the weakest positions on the roster. And now you look at the depth, it's, it's arguably the strongest position on the roster, both in terms of performance and potential. Uh, Noah Fant, I think, is going to have a very good year leading that off. But Nick Vanette, Jake Butt, Albert Okwebunam, no question that he was going to make the roster. The question now for Albert O is, does he get a jersey on game days? Because Andrew Beck, the man who can play fullback, H-back, tight end, as we alluded to earlier, has a big role on special teams. Andrew Beck is probably getting a, a jersey, which means Albert O may not, in spite of an outstanding camp and showing signs of being a monster. It's an embarrassment of riches at tight end. And given how hard it is to find tight ends, and w- the reason why I advocated taking Noah Fant last year was because those guys aren't easy to, to find. There are more receivers than tight ends because it's a unique skill set. Boy, oh boy. It's pretty exciting. And I think if I'm Pat Shermer, I'm thinking long and hard about having a lot of two tight end sets in my offense because I feel because I feel like that's where the strength of the offense could be. Yeah, you you have to have two tight ends tight ends out there often. And Mace, you said an embarrassment of riches. Uh, you said you're not going to be able to get all these guys on the field. You may not even be get a, able to be get all these guys jerseys. Huh. Should should you trade one? Okay. And who would that be? Because. I don't know how much value there truly is in Jake Butt outside of Denver because teams may view him uh, as just an injured guy right now. Alberto, every team passed up on him a couple of times. Nick Vanette, he, I mean, it, it, when I'm going down this, no, you're not going to trade one because Nick Vanette, yeah. any team could have signed him to a, a pretty good contract. And then you get to Noah Fant, and I mean, you're not going to trade Noah Fant, right? And Nick Vanette's the best blocker in the room. Yeah. And Noah Fant has elite level p- potential as a pass catching tight end. And uh, even though the offense wasn't consistent in training camp, no offense. He wasn't dropped when he was, when he was targeted, he wasn't dropping the ball. Yeah. He was making plays and he was getting involved in the screen game. There was one play in particular in the screen game. It works so well that Lloyd Cushenberry is looking around like, Who do I block? Because everybody's taken care of. And then Noah Fant just kind of waits and then just scoots past him upfield for what would have been a touchdown in game conditions, looking kind of like some of those big plays he had last year. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, maybe here's where you think about trading Jake, Butt. okay. And I still think he's the one that you consider trading if he shows that he's healthy. And let's say, I'd wait until after the Patriots game because I think <laughs> if there's a team that's obvious that's going to be in the market for tight ends, it's the New England Patriots right now. Yeah. And if and you know the Broncos waived injured Troy Fumagalli. If if I were the Patriots, when he came when he hit the waiver wire, I would claim Troy Fumagalli because Fumagalli had a good camp too. He did not as he good did. now, not as good as the others, but Troy Fumagalli would have made this team most years. Yeah, I Based think so. Based on the way he was playing. Definitely. So who? what would you do, Zach? I mean, is Butt the guy that you'd look to trade <sighs> once he proved he was healthy? Or are you just standing pat and saying, we have an embarrassment of riches at tight end, we're going to ride with it? Here's the thing. You, you do have one too many guys. And this is putting Nick Vanette off to the side. Because if you have Noah Fant and he continues to develop like you expect, and Albert O., if he develops like you expect, and from everything I've seen, he can certainly develop into that guy. You don't need another third dangerous receiving tight end, especially when you also could have an embarrassment of riches at the receiver position. It's not like you could really transform Jake Butt into a receiver. So Jake Butt is probably the guy that you'd want to trade. And mm. maybe, maybe you, you can't do it now because you have to prove that he's healthy. But maybe yeah. you trade him and you can get a second round pick. And because that's what he was kind of valued at coming out of the draft before he got hurt. And if you do that, then that's yeah. that's worth keeping him on the roster. But obviously that that is a play for many, many weeks down the line, Mace. It's just it's just an interesting thought to have and crazy how 18 months ago the Broncos had nothing at tight end. So mm-hmm. they had to give Jeff Jeff Hireman a two-year extension because they literally had nothing. That was right before they drafted 
uh, Noah Fant, nothing. And now we're talking about there's too many guys. Yeah, Jeff Hireman would not have made this team no. if the Broncos had kept him around through camp. He hasn't made any team, has he? No, he's still out there. Wow. Of course, he too has injury concerns. And uh, while I salute your optimism on the potential trade return of Jake Butt, realistically, I think if he showed he was healthy, you'd probably be willing to take a fourth or early fifth rounder and be done with it and move on. Okay. okay. Now, the, the interesting thing with Jake Butt, though, is that he actually – He's a restricted free agent because even though this is his fourth year after being drafted, he did not pick up a year of service time for that year when he was on the NFI list and uh, was back in 2017 and was never on the roster. So while his four-year contract expires after this year, he doesn't become an unrestricted free agent. So mm. it's an interesting scenario with Jake Butt being a potential RFA next March that adds some value to a potential trade right so mm -hmm. bro breaking down the tight ends Mace at running back there was absolutely no surprise there just exactly how we all thought it was going to break down once Royce really separated himself about 10 days ago yeah um, yeah and Royce Freeman he's a security blanket for Curtis Modkins and yeah. Pat Shermer because yep. running back as we all know it's a high attrition position Something happens to Melvin Gordon or Phil Lindsay. You can keep a one, at least a one and two rotation with Royce Freeman, and you have a lot of trust in him. He's pretty good in pass pro. He's gotten better at that over the course of his career, and that's that's why you may even see him pop in from time to time. Even though clearly it's Phil and Melvin that are one and one a, and they have some distance, kind of like the the top back. It's like, kind of like last year. There was a distance between Phil and Royce Freeman going down to Devontae Booker. Booker was clearly the number three. Yeah, w without a doubt. And at quarterback, Mace, Broncos did make one move there. They moved on from Brett Rippon, mm -hmm. who I think we both expect mm -hmm. to fully make the practice squad. Mm -hmm. Was that a bad decision, risking him to waivers? It's... Only a bad decision if he do, if he doesn't pass through waivers. So that's uh, that that's the whole thing. This is the risk here. Now, what they're gambling on is that Brett Rippon has more value to them than anybody else. That what has value as a third or even fourth quarterback is somebody who knows the scheme, which means Brett Rippon has value here. Does he have value to Cleveland or Miami? or Jacksonville, wherever, to the point where they'd claim him off waivers, but would have to start from zero with him in terms of learning the scheme. And they're they're gambling that he doesn't have that kind of value and that uh, they'll be able to get him back tomorrow. But if he doesn't pass through, boy, oh, you, you get a little bit nervous and you don't have a lot of options, although I know, Zach, I'll say it for you. Trevi Trev's on the market. Hey, <laughs> now we're talking, baby. <laughs> Brandon Allen's on the market. Oh, oh yeah, no, we're not. We're not, we're not talking. Here. He already uh, had his magnificent game with the Broncos, and, and that era is over. Paxton Lynch is on the market. <laughs> <laughs> Mace, how crazy is this? He'd be going into his fifth year option right now. Is that just wild? So crazy that we could be, I mean, if everything went to plan, we'd be talking about Paxton Lynch making some serious dough this year. Yeah, this would be his time, right? And it would have <laughs> changed everything about the Denver Broncos and everything about what we know about him if he had succeeded. Yeah. But alas, he didn't make it in Pittsburgh. And uh, I don't know if it's the end of the line in the NFL because with the 16 man practice squads i imagine he's going to be on somebody's practice squad not but, denver's oh gosh no <laughs> I, I don't i think there's absolutely no chance of that even though the roster has turned over about 75 80 percent from when paxton lynch was here in camp back in 2018 a time has flown since then yeah, it seriously has. I don't think the Broncos made a mistake by moving on from Brett Rippon. Like you said, Mace, I think he'll clear waivers because the Broncos ha have – he's the most valuable to the Broncos. So I don't think another team will pick him up. And right. if they do, I don't think it's the biggest deal. 
Uh, Drew's clearly your guy. So uh, I think that's probably the right move to move on from him, gamble with him going through waivers, and then uh, pick him up for the practice squad. All right, let's go to the and, offense. And bef oh, before we, I just want to jump in. There was one possibility, I think, that jumped out to me for Brett Rippon if the Broncos had let him go, and that was Philadelphia. But they kept Nate Sudfeld today, so they have three quarterbacks, Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts, who by all accounts has apparently had a hell of a camp as their mm. second-round pick, Real and bad. Nate Sudfeld, who's been around. So that would have been the, the place because Rich Gangarello is working on the Eagles staff right now. That's out of the equation, so I think the chances are pretty good that Brett Rippon is back unless Jacksonville feels a little froggy in the parlance of uh, Ryan Edwards and decides to make a move. <laughs> and let's go to the offensive line, Mace, where Calvin Anderson made the roster, made the 53 Broncos carrying nine offensive linemen, including Calvin Anderson. Of course, you, you kept Austin Schlotman to be your backup center in depth. You waived Patrick Morris, probably bring him back to the practice squad, mm -hmm. and you also kept DeMar Dotson. Anything surprise you across that offensive line board, Mace? Not at all, because Calvin Anderson looked to be ahead of Jake Rogers in how he was performing. The Broncos had him, of course, in last year learning things. Uh, he was coming a long way. I thought he had some good days out there uh, working at tackle. Uh, worked on both the left side and the right side. So he has the first versatility there. Now, clearly, I think he's the ninth guy in that room, which means he's going to be inactive. But it's another chance for Calvin to keep developing, see where he goes. If Elijah Wilkinson's foot ends up causing him further problems, then Calvin Anderson could end up being somebody who's a swing tackle and getting a jersey on game days and might even work his way in. But he, he outplayed Jake Rogers. I, th I think Calvin Anderson earned that spot. Really, the question was, were you going to keep eight offensive linemen or nine? Broncos opted for uh, opted for nine. And uh, congratulations to him. We'll keep it quiet. <laughs> Let's see him continue to develop. But uh, I'm excited to see him still on, on the roster. But, aside, but yeah, no surprises. And if they were going to keep nine, Calvin Anderson was going to be the ninth guy. Yeah, and I mean, just quietly, he's okay. making his way up because, of course, last year uh, was on the team a little bit and now really establishing himself as part of the team. We'll see if he continues to uh, move up, maybe continues to block two people in a single play more like he did earlier in training camp. And Mace, the final roster position to talk about is wide receivers. And just like they went deep at offensive line, Broncos go mm -hmm. deep at wide receiver. Yep. Again, of course, the usual suspects, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Deshaun Hamilton, Tim Patrick. And then you have Deontay Spencer making, his, making it as a returner. And great news coming with K.J. Hamler. He will not go on the injured reserve. Jake but or, or, uh, Vic Fangio and John Elway both expect K.J. Hamler to be getting back soon, running this week. And then, of course, Tyree Cleveland, the biggest surprise of this group, although Tyree Cleveland has had a very, very solid camp. Oh, yeah. And Tyree Cleveland had done enough and was getting enough buzz to where it would have been maybe tougher than I initially expected to push him through waivers and get him on the practice squad. But the reason why Tyree Cleveland ultimately made this roster based on what we heard from John Elway and Vic Fangio, special teams contribution. So basically, Tyree is handling the role that Fred Brown had last year, something you were hoping Jawan Winfrey would have. It also helped Tyree Cleveland that Jawan Winfrey was injured for part of camp as well. That yeah. gave Tyree a window, and he leapt right through it and claimed that roster spot. Yeah, exactly. And Jawan Winfrey... Uh, Broncos moved on from him. Could be a practice squad candidate. Juwan just never able to stay healthy, really never able to prove outside of one preseason game last year yeah. what he's able to do for the Broncos. Was hurt most of training camp this year, so it was very clear that he, he wasn't going to be part of this final 53. Could keep him around, but Mace, to me, Juwan Winfrey is just a guy that you can't rely on. It, you couldn't rely on him at CU to stay healthy. First two years, you couldn't rely on him to stay healthy here. They may keep him around, but if they don't on the practice squad, that's not something that would shock me. Yeah, you've also got uh, Trinity Benson, who was let go. No surprise there, but he's got some returnability. So you could see Benson or Kendall Hinton 
undrafted rookie who also has some return potential. I expect that they will have somebody on their practice squad who is a potential returner in case something happens to Deontay Spencer. So that's yeah. where you keep your you keep your eyes on Hinton, Benson, and we'll get to running back in a moment. Levante Bellamy is going to be in that mix as well. So you're going to have some possibilities there in case you need someone else to return kickoffs and punts. Yeah, Levante Bellamy is a lock in my mind to make mm-hmm. the, the the practice squad. And talking to Vic or John Elway earlier today, uh, he said that this wasn't necessarily a difficult cut day for him. He said, obviously, it's tough to make these cuts and, and to cut mm-hmm. these guys, but we only had to go from 80 to 53. And also, you bring in 16 guys back, so you're really only cutting the dreams of 11 people, which is still terrible, mm-hmm. terribly tough. But that that's, that's the fact, Mace, is most of the guys, if not all of the guys on the Broncos practice squad, are going to be guys that they cut today. So you're keeping most of them bringing them back tomorrow. Uh, So you're really only moving on from 11 guys. So a lot of opportunity for the guys that were cut today to still have their dreams continue. And one more thing. Remember last year, there were a slew of moves after the cut down. And remember John Elway talking about River Craycraft as the punt returner with a less than enthusiastic endorsement saying, yeah, you know, uh, he is the guy for now, but he oh, right. taking a look. And I just thought I, I, I felt bad for poor C- River Cray Cray. Because, yeah, yeah. I thought, man, John, that was yeah. Cray Cray. What you said that was Cray Cray, and that was cruel. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, uh, and so it's a difference this year because John Elway indicated probably not a lot of activity coming. I know there are fans that are dreaming of Miles Jack. Yes. Doesn't sound like that's going to be in the cards here. And no. um, the other thing I think also, uh, with all respect to, to Miles Jack and bringing in some other guys, remember, they brought in Mark Barron. They brought in DeMar Dotson. Those two guys are $5.5 million combined under the cap. You let go of Todd Davis, and that's $4.5 million, and And the trade of Christian Covington in that, in that Calitro-Covington exchange You gain $750,000. So think of it this way, Zach. The two veterans you signed were $5.5 million under the cap. The Todd Davis Covington trade moves $5.25 million. So effectively, all that only had a net of impact of $250,000 on your cap. And oh, by the way, you're able to carry over space from this year to next year. And so while the cash budget is going to play in as well, right now, Zach, the Broncos have over $30 million of cap space that they can carry over to next year. And they have 166.2 million in commitments for next year. And by the way, that includes Juwan James's 2020 contract terms rolling in next year. So it's possible Zach, that unless there are more big moves, the Broncos may be playing the long game here and saying, you know, in a year where a lot of teams are going to be cutting, to get down to the limit that we could be sitting here in good shape with 30, with $39 million of cap space when you're including the carryover and the ability to easily make some more space with a couple of moves here. That being said, if you want to re-sign Justin Simmons, that's 15 million that you can wipe off right there. So this matters. And so I think I expect the Broncos to be judicious on any guys that they bring in in the future, in part because they're thinking about both their cash and cap budgets. Yeah, yeah. And I don't expect this to be a move to go get you, Davion. I know a lot of people are saying, uh, you know, yeah, now you have $30 million. Go get Miles Jack. Go get you, Davion Clowney. Yeah. Spend all the money. But Mace, and this isn't sexy, like I said on Twitter yesterday, the Broncos are setting themselves up very well for next year, either to have $40 million in cap space to make their team even better when they truly think they can make a run uh, at potentially contending for the Super Bowl, or if the cap does drop to $175 million next year, Mm -hmm. well, then you don't have to cut you know, your four highest paid players in order to get down below that 175, the Broncos wouldn't have to make any big moves. They wouldn't have to make any moves if they didn't want to sign anyone else. They could stick with the roster that they have going into 2021 uh, for the most part and be just fine. Whereas a lot of other teams would have to make some huge cuts 
in order to get below that. So that's just why I don't see the Broncos making any big moves with this $30 million. And you know what? Those huge cuts are going to mean more, more players on the market. Yeah. So you're going to have a market that's constricted because teams are having to make significant cuts to be in cap compliance. And yet the Broncos may not have to make many moves and could be in position to capitalize on this. So yeah, I, I get, why you may look at a clowny, you may look at trading for a Miles Jack and say, ooh, tempting, tempting. Just hang on because you can do better for the long term just by sitting and and waiting. And uh, you know, we'll 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 see what they end up doing. There there are some contracts they can work with to create some more space. And uh, you know, it's one of the, we talked about Von Miller throughout the offseason. We certainly did. That's eighteen point. That's over eighteen million dollars. It was eighteen point seven five million, I believe, off the top of my head. And he's got to deliver. Otherwise, at minimum, he is in line for a. Re, they will. He's in line for a restructure. But that being said, John Elway likes where Von Miller is. Von seems to be in very good spirits. If he goes out there and has 14 sacks, then you pay him that big money next year and you say, thank you very much. Yep, exactly. You don't have to worry about cutting him because you've set yourself up well. <laughs> and guys, because I love WGT golf so much, I got to tell you about it another time. And I want you to play with me. I want you to play with us and this awesome DNVR community that we have on WGT golf. So go to dnvrgolf.com to download WGT Go into the clubhouse section and search for DNVR3 Clubhouse. Join that one because we already filled up one and two. We have 750 members of this awesome community playing WGT, and we want you to play as well. And why I love WGT and have for the past decade is because of how realistic it is. And you're playing real courses from Bandon Dunes to Wolf Creek, Pebble Beach, and of course, the lovely St. Andrews. I love how realistic the game is. I love how you can play 18 holes and take a while with it, or you can play three quick holes if you have five minutes when you're waiting at a dental dentist's office or something like that. So make sure to go and check out WGT. Download it at dnvrgolf.com. Don't forget, there are other sports going on. Of course, we're all about football. We don't have hockey anymore because the abs lost. Nuggets have a tough series. Don't forget about rugby, Colorado rugby. You may have heard us mention there are some big things happening in the Colorado rugby space, and now we can tell you all about it because DMVR is covering all things rugby in Colorado and the United States with our reporter Colton Strickler, who keeps you up to date on all things American rugby with that DMVR rugby podcast and all the written content that he's posting at the DMVR.com. Now, it's big time. It's a it's a big time in rugby, even though sports are still kind of waking up because Infinity Park in Glendale will be the new official training center for the men's and women's USA Eagles 15s teams, which makes Colorado the place to be for rugby in the United States. So the DMVR rugby podcast is all about the national team right now. So listen to the DMVR rugby podcast with Colton Strickland. Learn about rugby through the podcast as well. He's doing basic rugby 101 pods that will break down the game for you. They're incredible. They helped me learn about rugby as I got into watching the Super League down in New Zealand when it was basically the first sport one of the first sports back over the summer and had fans. And I really enjoyed it because those rugby one-on-one podcasts helped me grasp all the nuances of the sport. Rugby has now become a, a sport that I, I love to watch. I love having that as part of my sports fan portfolio. So listen to the DMVR rugby podcast and follow the coverage from Colton Strickland. Remember supporting our partners is supporting us and everything going on in infinity park in Glendale. They're, they're a great partner for us and they're a great part of the Denver sports community. So check out, the DNVR Rugby Podcast. Yes, most definitely. And speaking of great parts of our community, let's hop into the questions. Of course, we threw an emergency pod at you yesterday, breaking down the news of Todd Davis. So got a lot of those questions answered on that podcast. We have a short comment section here, but we're still going to get to your questions. First one coming in from Peyton is my manic. Hey guys, I wanted to ask if you've noticed a difference in Von Miller's behavior over training camp as far as him taking on more of a leadership role. Thanks so much. Wouldn't say I've noticed a big difference. I mean, he's uh, he's enjoying himself out there. He's playing well. That's he's for play, sure. Playing with energy, that's a huge thing. But Vaughn al always showed leadership, especially with the outside linebackers. He, you know, he would take Shaq Barrett, 
for example, a few years ago and show him some pass rush tips. And he still does that kind of thing. So I think he's showing leadership, but I don't think it's much different than before. Yeah, he's he's Von Miller, and he's just he's a great guy to be around. Very fun. A couple of practices ago, Mace, when uh, the pass rush was doing drills against the offensive line, he he wasn't practicing that day, but he was hooting and hollering so loud he, we could hear pretty much every word he was screaming from over a hundred yards away because he was just having such a blast with it. So yeah. Von 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 is, is is Von. You know, even when he wasn't the the big leader that he says he wasn't a couple of years ago, he was still having fun. He was still a fantastic teammate. And that's what we've certainly continued to see uh, this training camp. Yep. Drew for MVP. Guys, we did it. Last week without football is over now. Broncos football is back. I just want to say thank you. It's amazing how you guys managed the last months, despite the huge negative imp impact coronavirus had on the sports world. You can be proud of yourself and the community we represent. Mace, I saw the post in the DMVR lounge about, lounge about your article hanging in the press conference room. Congratulations, man. I'm so happy for you because you truly represent Broncos football. Getting ready for Tennessee. Have a nice day. And again, thank you for your awesome job. Well, thanks for the kind words, Drew, for MVP. And yeah, I mean, obviously I can't see it in person right now because we don't have media going into the press conference room. But uh, yeah, it, but. Phil Milani and Eric Schubert both sent me some pictures. An article I wrote from the day Peyton Manning signed with the Broncos, signed with the Broncos, has press conference. I was freelancing for the New York Times that day, and they took that article and blew it up, and they put it on the wall in the press conference room. It's right next to a Woody Page's story from Super Bowl 50 that was on the front of the Denver Post. Honored. That's pretty amazing to see. It's kind of immortalized like that and yeah that is that is awesome. too too cool can't wait to see that in the press room hopefully mm -hmm. this year but man maybe next year when the broncos are contending for that super bowl that's that's too cool mace yep count locula on a scale of one to wtf what level of surprise would you say you had initially after roster cutdowns love the count i, I would say I, I would say almost i'd say the wt what the <laughs> because there there were a lot of surprising moves, Mace. Todd Davis cut coming out of nowhere. And then today, Devontae Bosby coming out of nowhere again. Mm -hmm. Justin Hollins, a pretty good surprise. Especially if you would have told me the Broncos kept five inside linebackers and four outside linebackers, I'd say, yeah, Justin Hollins, absolute yeah. lock. No, instead they go Joe Jones over him. So a lot of surprises there. We didn't talk about Derek Tuska. Not a surprise there because of what Vic Fangio said mm. about him a couple of days ago. I mean, if Vic <laughs> Fangio didn't define what the practice squad is for when talking about Derek Tuska, I, I don't know what he was talking about then, but Derek Tuska will very much be on the practice squad. He's a guy that needs to continue to develop uh, uh, physically, and that's exactly what Vic said. So that wasn't a surprise, but a lot of surprise moves, Mace. Yeah, Vic is old enough and has coached long enough to, in the NFL to remember when it was called the developmental squad. And that's an accurate term for what Derek Tuska is going to be doing. He's going to be developing. It's effectively going to be a red shirt year for him, and, and that's fine. But, uh, yeah, the Hollins, mild surprises. Uh, the big one is uh, – the big ones, obviously, are Todd Davis and Devontae Bosby, and then mild surprise in Justin Hollins. Mild surprise that they went with nine offensive linemen, although, again, that was kind of a, a bubble thing either way. I wasn't surprised that Tyree Cleveland made the 53, though, based on what we'd seen from him. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. And, of mm -hmm. course, Drew Locke. Made uh, a 53 uh, man roster. <laughs> yeah. You want to take a few more comments here that came in during the podcast as well. Let, let's do it. Let's get okay. to them. All right. Let's start with this one from Big Smooth 84. By the way, I was a fan of Sam Perkins, so I love that nickname. Do you guys think we will bring in another inside linebacker and tackle? No, I don't think so. Um, now, if for some reason a good tackle were to fall, then yeah, I do think mm -hmm. that's a place the Broncos would make a move. Good tackles don't just fall into laps this time of year. An inside linebacker, Mesa, I, I think they already did it. Yep. They brought in Austin Calitro. They brought in Mark Barron. Those are the moves. Now, they did move on from Todd Davis. That was the most recent move at, at linebacker, but I think it's because of the guys they brought in. 100%. This one from J.W. Osborne. Fans don't watch football in the future. We watch it in the present, so they should go after the best players now 
DB Farrell. I think this is in response to what we're saying about take that cap space and carry it over <laughs> for next year. <laughs> yeah, and here, here's it, I totally understand where you're coming, JW, but Mace, even with Alex Smith balling out, playing the best football of his life, and by the way, Alex Smith, awesome story making it with the, the Washington football team. Yeah. So cool to see. Um, but even with Alex Smith balling out with Kansas City, the uh, Chiefs took the long road and said, we're going to use a first-round pick. In fact, we're going to use two first-round picks to draft Patrick Mahomes. And how did that work out? Yeah, good point. Derek Wright asks, is Callahan playing outside only now? If so, who's playing the nickel? Duke Dawson? No, actually, I would say that Callahan is mostly playing inside. Now, if you have two cornerbacks on the field, Callahan will be outside. Uh, but when you bring a third cornerback on the field, you're going to be sliding Callahan in there pretty much every time. Yeah. J-Rod Lumba says, yo, what's up, Mace? You have 75 figures behind you. You know what? <laughs> if you count the stuff that you can't see on camera, it actually is right around 75 bobbleheads right now. You can't see, for example, my Star Wars baseball collection of uh, you know guys like Carlos Gonzalez wearing a Django Fett uh, getup for his bobblehead, or my mascot collection where I've got Bucky Badger and Captain Fear from the Bucks and Miles from the Broncos. And, of course, not sure he's everyone's favorite, but he's my daughter's favorite. Dinger. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> From the Rockies. <laughs> Dinger Dinger is a classic. You got to have Dinger. Mace, you, you got to just, f f for for Mace being Mace, you got to have 75 of those back there. That That is absolutely true. <laughs> Kenneth Booker with an interesting comment here worth noting. They're going to have trouble, talking about the Broncos, with dink and dunk offenses, offenses that do not allow the pass rush to have much effect. Ah, like the Oakland Raiders. Ooh, yeah. Although like, they, 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 Kept them off the scoreboard generally, kept the score down last year in week 17, but Oakland was able to move the ball up and down the field. The Broncos needed that goal line stand in the fourth quarter to make a difference, but didn't Oakland have something like a two and a half to one advantage in total yardage that day? Yeah. 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 And, and two years ago when the Raiders played in Denver, I remember yeah. Derek Carr was getting the ball out like a half a second after the snap and yeah. Von Miller and Bradley Chubb were just able to do nothing. Yep. Death by paper cuts. Dustin asks who won the long snapper competition. <laughs> Jacob Bob and Moyer will be your long snapper out of Northern Colorado. And I had the chance to talk to him a couple of days ago. So going to have a story here on the DMVR.com about his journey to the Denver Broncos, because, Hey, you know, we, we cover the team from all angles, all sides, like you get to know uh, even the guys who are on the fringe of the roster. Really cool to talk to, to Jacob Bob and Moyer. I enjoyed him and I'll uh, be pulling for him. Yes, with without a doubt. Mace, one coming in right now from Eduardo. He says, do you guys think Graham Glasgow is healthy for week one? I think he will be. I think he'll be back at practice this week. Uh, the fact that he was on the field toward the end of this week, not practicing, but on the field, uh, working with team trainers on Thursday and then watching practice from the sideline, it's a good sign for him as he comes back. Uh, it's not the same kind of injury as an ankle or a hamstring, pardon me, like KJ Hamler has. So maybe you're not going to be as cautious. I think Graham Glasgow will be in the lineup good to go week one. I think so too. I think the, the bigger concern is Bradley Chubb's injury. And John Elway, again, I mean, th the more we talk to Vic Fangio and today talking to John Elway, the more concerned I am about, about Bradley Chubb and his not full-on availability for week one, mm -hmm. but how much he's going to play, uh, if he'll be, how close to 100% will be. We know he's not going to be 100%. Uh, so I'm more concerned about him than Glasgow. I fully mm -hmm. expect Glasgow to play and him to be fine. And finally, this one from JMAD59 coming in recently. Shout out to Andrew Beck. I'm glad there's an Andrew on the roster, Zach. <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah, <laughs> shout out to Andrew Beck. Man, it honestly seemed too good to be true. He just seemed like a lock this whole time. And we just talked about him as a lock this whole time. And when you talk about a guy that is a fullback that in, in an offense that you don't have a fullback, you do get a little cautious if that's going to happen. But his special teams, his versatility, he can be a tight end as well. All played into him just being too valuable all around to let him go. Yeah, and one also coming in here from Protein Wisdom. I know Elway said we won't be too active on the waiver wire, but do you see Duke Dawson sticking? 
Well, if they do make one or two moves, I would certainly put Duke Dawson as one of the guys that would could be one of the first guys cut uh, if they make a move there. Yeah, I would agree. That being said, earlier today I mentioned the Broncos could look at safeties around the league, and I think they'll just take a cursory look. But John Elway and Vic Fangio indicated, hey, this is our roster. Pretty comfortable with what they've got, and they're pretty comfortable with players listed at other positions providing the depth at safety behind Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson, and then the number three safety, of course, Trey Marshall, who started two games late last year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Mace, I think that'll do it for us today. I'm so happy that we were able to get in this special Saturday podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us on this live podcast. And if you're listening in regular form, thank you so much for joining us on a special edition of this weekend podcast. And before we get out of here, Mace, third time's a charm, right? Mm -hmm. Got to tell you about WGT because I kid you not, guys, I've been playing this game for a decade, way before DNVR, way before BSN, way before WGT and DNVR teamed up because I love this game. It's not only my favorite golf game, it's my favorite game, just just game, period. Mm -hmm. I love it so much because of how realistic it is. And, and I mentioned the courses you can play earlier. Not just the courses are realistic, but the gameplay is realistic. It's fun. Putting is difficult, just like in real life. You get to create your own character, and now you get to play with the awesome DNVR community. So get in there. Go to dnvrgolf.com. Download WGT to get in on this weekend's tournament. Well, Mace, that'll do it for us today. Thank you all so much for rolling with us today. Broncos have three days off. They have today off, they have Sunday off, and they have Monday off. They'll be back on Monday for what will be game week, real football right around the corner. So we will talk to you guys on Tuesday. Have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy the holiday this weekend. Be safe, have fun, and Mace, man, we're so close to football. Next time we talk to you, yes. it'll be Denver Broncos game week. Have a great weekend, guys.